In Mark chapter 6, verse number 44, the Bible tells us that Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Now, now, here's the thing. I know that in our minds we say God fed the 5,000 and that's where we keep it, but that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture tells us that he fed 5,000 men plus their families. The magnitude of this is, is, is large enough when you're feeding 5,000 men with, with, with two fish and five loaves. But when you begin to multiply 5,000 men by their families, quickly you can get above 20,000 with no problems whatsoever. There could have been 30, there could have been 40, there could have been 50. I don't know. All I know was that there was a huge magnitude of needy people and the compassion of God fell upon Jesus to the point that he knew something had, had to be done. And before it was over with, these disciples were holding in their hands. After they fed all the multitudes, all the multiplied thousands, here they are standing with 12 baskets in their hands of revelation that God is a provider. That God will meet my need right where I'm at. That they learned the principle that little is much when God is in it. But not only as little as much when God is in it, more than enough, God will meet the need. Not, not just merely supply what is needed, but he's a more than God. Now, now the, the scripture tells us that, that it goes further. That immediately after this, Jesus began to insist that his disciples get on a boat and go across the lake and, and to go into a, a different part for, for ministry. Now, here, here's the thing. This great miracle takes place, and, and a miracle that our world really needs to, to know that, that God does meet our need no matter what. That there, there, there He is providing, there, there He is supplying, be, being not only a resource, but being the very source for the child of God. But then He begins to transition. Transition, and he begins to bring to us an even greater lesson. That not only can the provision, miracle working of God take care of the masses, not only is God a compassionate God, but we find out that God's about to be a God that can calm even the storms in our life. Things that we might have set in order, things that we might not have asked for, and for the disciples, they didn't ask for this. Jesus told them to get in the boat Go to the other side. And the Bible says that in verse 48, he tells everybody goodbye. And the Bible says that while the disciples are getting in the boat, he goes up to the hills by himself and he begins to pray. And as he's praying late that night, verse 47 says that the disciples were in their boat. He's alone up on the hill praying. And right there in the middle of the lake, he sees somehow, I don't know how, but he sees. He sees the disciples right there in the storm that they were in. Verse 48 tells us that. It tells us that he saw, that God saw. I want to remind somebody that God sees you right where you're at. This is not overtaking God. God God's on the throne. God knows uh, about these situations. God's a sovereign God. He's a knowing God. And, and as far apart as Jesus was from the disciples, as night had set in, as storms had set in, he saw they were in serious trouble. He saw their toiling. He saw the torture of their fear. The storm uh, was causing distress. They were rowing hard, the scripture says. And the Bible says here that they were struggling against the wind. They were struggling against the waves. And they had been against these things for absolute hours. They were at their wits ends, had to be. Here they are working. They're doing their best to survive. They're doing their best to endure. And don't forget that all day long they had been with Jesus ministering to the multiplied thousands. It's not just a matter of going to two or three people and passing out a few baskets. Thousands of people had to be waited upon. And now because of the storm and because of all of the hours they had already previously worked, they are at a point of exhaustion and even at a place of desperation. 
And the Bible says, the King James Version says, that in the fourth watch, here in this translation, it says at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning or 3 o'clock. It could have been anywhere from 3 to 6. That was the, the, the fourth watch. And here we find Jesus coming toward them, walking on the very thing that was against them. Here's the thing. He intended to go past them. Now, that's, that's, that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. He intended to go past them. Now, now, now he was aware of their hardship. He, he was aware of the torture. He was aware of the distress. He, he was aware of the struggle that they were in. And the Bible said that he would or intended to go past them. But, thank God, thank God the disciples had enough sense to, to, to see to see him walking on the water. And there as he comes walking on the water, the Bible talks about their fear. It talks about the, their terror. It talks about even them thinking that maybe Jesus was a, a ghost, but nevertheless, they cried out. And the Bible said that they were all terrified. And when they saw him, here's what happens. Jesus spoke to them at once and said, whatever you do, children, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, fear not. Matter of fact, the King James Version says, take courage, be of, be of good cheer. The difference maker was in these next words. Here it is, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped and, and the disciples were totally amazed. Here's the thing, this was not the first time that these guys had been in this kind of situation, even in a storm, even in a boat. But this time, Jesus didn't do what he did the first time, go up to the bow of the boat, speak to the wind, speak to the waves, and it listened to him. He just got in the boat, and when he got in the boat, the effect of his presence brought peace. My God, have mercy. Why don't you let him in right where you're at right now? That's what this world needs more than anything is a church that lets God in. Call out to him, cry Watch the effects of his presence today. Didn't even speak. He got in the boat and peace came. And here's the thing, that even with what had just gone on, feeding the thousands, what he had just done by getting in the boat, walking on the water, the miracle that was just done, the Bible said that they still didn't understand the significance of the miracles of the loaves because their hearts were too hardened to take it in. Isn't it amazing the impact of now, the impact of now, both positively and, and negatively. Just a few hours before, they had seen the miracle of the feeding of the thousands. Just a few hours before, they had seen the wonderful compassion of Jesus and moved in compassion and said, something's got to be done. And, and, and there was faith and there was rejoicing in that now moment. But that now moment had been swallowed up now in doubt and in confusion. What had happened was is that their current struggle had captured their hearts, had captured their minds, had captured their emotions, had, had, had stirred up fear which counsels out their faith. Their faith has been shipwrecked, has been kidnapped, has been uh, nullified, if you will, and here, uh, th this, this, this moment is being totally absorbed into their spirit and they're thinking, we're going to die. This is it. Any lesson learned the last few hours had already been gone a long time ago. The uncertainty of the struggle, the current struggle they were in had shackled them. This uncertainty of the struggle that they were now in had shackled them to the point that they couldn't believe on what God had already proven that he could do. And to make things worse, we read verse number 48 and the scripture simply says this, he intended on going past them. He intended on just walking on by. Now that you're talking about a wow moment. Sometimes I'm wowed by the, the power of God and, and, and God doing things and standing there with your mouth open saying, man, that's an, he's an awesome God. But to know that Jesus would have walked past them, wow. 
Is, is Mark really suggesting that Jesus was unconcerned about their struggles, especially since he was just moved with such great compassion for the hunger and the need of the thousands? One moment he's concerned and, and the next minute he's not concerned even for his own disciples. Not only had the disciples just learned a lesson about the provision of God, as I said just a moment ago, this wasn't their first time being in a storm. This is not an isolated case. They had already been in one boat crisis. They had low faith at that time. They were paralyzed in fear just as they were this second time. And both times, they both, both, both occasions, the disciples ends up marveling. But that was then. This is now. And some of you say that. Well, I know that God's done something way back then. I heard grandpa and grandma talking about the God that used to. I've heard mom and daddy tell me about the God that used to, but where is God today? That, that was then. That was way back then. This is now, pastor. I need a now God. I promise you God is a now God. He's a God that introduced himself as not an I was God or an I will God. God is a God that is I am that I am. He is right there right now. And I promise you, not only is he in this, on the scene for our nation, our nation, our counties, our city, our states, but I promise you for the entire globe, the presence of God is circling this globe and God's going to use this crisis and he's going to touch hearts. And I believe that what the enemy, once again, what the enemy has meant for bad, God's going to turn it again for a great awakening of his glory to fall. This current crisis, Pastor, go back to it. I'm in a current crisis. I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a current situation. In Mark chapter four, it tells us about the first encounter that they had. I'm, going to, I'm not going to read it all, but I'm just going to hit you, hit you with it and run. The Bible says in verse 37 of Mark four, talking about their first encounter with a storm, it was a fierce storm that came up. There was high waves. It was breaking in upon the boat. The boat began to fill up with water. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat, his head on a cushion, and the disciples wakes him up shouting at Jesus, saying, don't you even care? Somebody might be saying that. Does God not only care? Does he not care? Does he not care? And the Bible says, you don't even care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, the Bible says that he rebuked the wind. And he began to rebuke the water. And he says, silence and be still. And the Bible says that suddenly, hallelujah, that's what somebody needs right now is a suddenly. A suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm that came in to that, uh, upon those disciples in that boat that day. And the disciples were terrified once again. He begins to minister to them. He says, why are you afraid? Why are you fearful? Why don't you have any faith? They begin to talk among themselves, who is this man? And they asked one another that this man, when he speaks, the waves and the winds obey him, man. Isn't it amazing how easily we can forget who God is? Who is this man? Baffled. There, there, there is this failure at times for us to grasp the revelation of his identity. Why, why is this so hard? Before we get really judgmental for the disciples having two occasions and two storms and same thing happens both times and they don't even learn a lesson. Before we get too judgmental, don't we do the same? How often do we catch question the provisions of God for our life. Does he even know me? Does he even care? Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he, maybe he is unconcerned. Maybe he, he, he's going to walk past me just like he intended on walking past the disciples this time. But here's the thing. As much as I am a man of God, I am a son of man. I'm humanity. I, I have moments of concern I have moments of fear. Why is God about to pass them? Why, why, why does God do the things that he does? Why does God allow the things that he allows? My mind went to Job chapter nine. And this is what Job says and he's trying to bring it all in and all this craziness is happening in his life and he's, he's questioning and his friends are coming to him and saying, you know, you might as well just... Quit, throw up your hands. His wife is nagging in his back ear, just curse God and die. And he's got all of this pressure on his life and all of the calamity that's happened. His world has just been taken over. 
And Job begins to speak. And this is what he says. Job says that without warning, Job 9, 5, it says this, without warning, he moves the mountains and overturns them. Verse, verse number six says, he shakes the earth from its place and the foundations tremble. In verse number seven, he commands, if he commands, the sun won't even rise and the stars won't shine. And he alone has spread out the heavens and watch this, this is the reason why it ties in. I love this, you ready? He marches on the waves of the sea. Man, here he comes. He made all the stars. He made the constellations of the southern sky. He even gets specific in, in, in telling us what they were and who they were and what the names of them were. Verse number 10, he does great things too marvelous to understand. He performs countless miracles yet. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. Yet. He does all of these mar marvelous things, these miracles, these powerful things, yet when he moves by, I don't, even, I don't even see him go. Sometimes we scarcely can take it in, can we? For, for just a second, I want you to think with me. Go with me. God. Say that word with me. God. Say it with me right where you're at. God. I want you to take that in. God. God Almighty. Our Little, limited, finite minds trying to comprehend God. And what might I ask is this big storm that we're facing. What is the uncertainty of our day? What is a coronavirus compared to him? Their distress was seen. He didn't miss it. Remember, he saw it, and that's what brought him off the mountain, the hill, from praying to come to them. And he comes walking on the water. And he comes close enough to be noticed. Maybe that's what God's doing for us today. Maybe he's making his pass by you and pass by me, even pass by the church, and saying, I wonder if anybody's going to notice. It wasn't that he didn't want to be bothered. And it surely wasn't that he was wanting to be left alone. Here comes the one that's just fed the thousands and now is walking on what was against his own disciples. Only God could do that. Here's the point. The elementary principle for us to live by is simply this. You must cry out to him. Remember that. You've got to cry out to God. I read this week that, that divine disposition, divine disposition does not rule out human action. I like that. What does that mean, pastor? Come on, help me out. Okay. Just because God saves doesn't mean he doesn't want to be asked or invited or welcomed. We don't just sit back and, and wait for God to save us. We cry out to God we cry out for salvation, we cry out for help, and God comes to us. He would have passed them by if they hadn't called out. When these two guys were walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, they didn't realize that they were with Jesus, and the Bible said that he would have continued on, but they said, no, 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 wait, 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 don't go on, come in with us, sit with us, Come commune with us, have fellowship with us. And it was after the meal that their eyes were open to the fact that they had been with Jesus the entire time. We use our faith to be proactive. We use it to wait, to endure, to cry out, to seek God diligently. And with that same faith, we continue. We continue to serve God. We continue to be a child of God, continue to be the church even in, in, in challenging times just like this. And I'll tell you something even better than that. We use that faith to worship. We use that faith to cry out to God, to call out to God. Because I want you to understand our uncertainties are no match for his sureties. Our uncertainties are no match to his certainties. There's a lot that we can learn from the previous generations. Someone picked up a pen one time and wrote an old standard for the church. 
They make a statement with the first verse. They make a statement with the course. And then they begin to ask questions. And this is what it says. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Then he questions, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Statement, truth, take it to the Lord in prayer. Call on him. Can, can, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't let him pass you by. Cry out. Express your need for him. So often we tell the Lord, ah, I got this. Or at least that's how we live. I, I, I got this. this. This one's in my care. This one's in my hands. I'll take care of my children. I'll, I'll take care of my health. I'll take care of my living. I'll take care of my education. I, I, I've got this. Until. 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 We must develop a constant awareness of our need and dependency upon him. We never know what the next moment will bring but we do know him. So let me bring this to a close. We bulldozed Dozier to end to 2020. Man, man, our church, the, the numbers, the people who were coming, the folks that have been saved, people that are wanting to join the church, all these wonderful, beautiful things, the prosperity of God's anointing and revival and the presence of God, great stuff. Then along comes Corona. See, here's the thing. If it's not coronavirus, it will be something else. The enemy is going to offer many distractions in these last days. The, the uncertainty of the disciples met the surely of God. The uncertainty of the disciples met the surely of God, and I want to introduce to you right now. I want to introduce you to that God once again, that God that I've preached for and preached about for all of these years, I promise you, God doesn't change. God is still as much God now as he's ever been. The uncertainties of the disciples met the surely of God, and I'm asking you, come face to face with that today. The uncertainty of our day is not without the surely of God today. This time, just the presence of him in the boat. Just the presence of him in the boat made the difference for the disciples. They had this experience with God one time before and he spoke and he showed them, this is what I can do. But this time they said, just get on board. And when he got on board, everything around them began to change. Here's the thing. The winds can continue to blow. The rain can continue to fall. Troubles will mount insurmountable. But when God's presence comes, just as you're right where you're at right now, the flood of God's presence can come in to your life to build you up touch you to love you so let me remind you child of God he's in control he's aware he's on the throne he's God more so he's your God and don't let another second swallow you up when you can call on him. Maybe, maybe you're watching today and normally that might not be what you normally would do. But somehow or another you caught wind that this was how church was going to be and you were just wondering how it was going to go. 
and your heart's been touched today. Maybe you don't know who the Lord is. Maybe, maybe he was a childhood memory, but he's not a now certainty. Maybe you got wet, signed the card, joined the church, but there was no change in your life. Maybe you've never accepted God. Maybe you've wandered away and become prodigal in your spirit and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Right where you're at, let me lead you to Him. I want you to listen. Listen closely. He loves you. I pray this prayer with me. Father, I ask you to come into my life. I need you. I'm asking you to be my Savior and my Lord. I turned my back on yesterday. I turned my back on failure. I turned my back on sin. And with this mouth, I confess what my heart is feeling. Jesus, you left me. You died for me, and you're coming again. But I'm ready because I've accepted you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, wow. So glad you prayed that prayer with me. I don't know how long we'll have to do this. I'm hoping that somehow, miraculously, we'll be able to come back next week all together. But you just stay tuned, stay connected. When we go off in just a second, they'll, they'll show you one more time how you can stay connected to the church. And we're going to stay connected to you, I promise. We're going to do everything that we can to continue to minister to you and make a difference in our community, in your life, and for your family. Man, we love you so very, very much. I want us to go out. Matter of fact, Pastor Javen, would you sing a little bit of that that you were just playing just a few moments ago? He's able to speak to our storms. And as he begins to take us out, I love you. God bless you. Pastor Javen, sing a little bit of that if you don't mind.